that we have uh, Chris Perry with the First Five Years Fund, Rich Neiman with Neiman Collaborative, and also uh, Pre-K Our Way and Brenda Berg from Best NC with us. It's real privilege to have all of these very amazing, talented people, not only in the same city, but on the same panel. So we are, are lucky to have them here. So I'm gonna start by just introducing each of them, giving you a little background, and then I have a challenge for you as we think about and as you're listening to what they have to say. And then at the end, we'll have time for some questions, which, so be thinking about what do you wanna follow up on. So for those of you who don't know Chris, and I, I sort of alluded uh, this to Chris, she's kind of my personal hero, so I'm really excited that she's here. Um, she is the executive director of the First Five Years Fund, um, and, and at, in that position understands that America's future lies in the health and well-being of the country's youngest children. She has dedicated her career to bringing resources and support to parents, caregivers, and the early learning workforce to ensure children grow up healthy and ready to succeed in school and life. So she's one of you. Chris is a national thought leader on early childhood education who has appeared in the New York Times, Politico, Washington Post, Salon, Congressional Quarterly, and many other news outlets across the country. Uh, previously, she served as executive director of First Five California, fostering their emergence as one of the most well-known and respected advocates for early childhood development on the state and national levels. And her dedication to children and families I'm guessing it actually began before this, but professionally at the uh, Alameda County Social Services Agency, where she worked for more than 12 years in various capacities, including child abuse investigator, family preservation case manager, and program manager. So she really is one of you. And um, it's good to have an advocate at the national level who is not only looking out for children, but understands the perspectives that all of you bring to the table. Next, we have Rich Neiman, and those of us in the Smart Start world have a, a particular affection for Rich. Um, he's been in the conference several times and sharing his wisdom. Uh, he works at the confluence of politics, policy, and consumerism to create social and economic change. He has built a successful career on his ability to synthesize disparate information into clear, concise, and compelling persuasion. Uh, this is my favorite sentence. I have to give Rich grief every time uh, for this. He's a graduate in English from UCLA. Rich was pummeled by, let me see, semioticians. Did I get that right? And structuralists, yeah. semioticians. <laughs> Long, that, that is clear and concise um, communication. It sure is, isn't it? <laughs> um, before the notion of seizing issues by seizing the language used to describe them uh, became fashionable. He has spent much of his uh, career helping people gain power by gaining control over words and images. Uh, he develops messages that tap into attitudes, touch shared values, and unite different audiences around common objectives. You've heard many of these messages if you have ever looked at the Heckman Equation website. He works with First Five Years Fund and others, so you've seen his work everywhere. Um, uh, and he uh, is skilled branding, he is a skilled in branding strategic message and creative development, naming and renaming, and in providing solutions to change seemingly intractable public perceptions. So welcome, Rich. Thank you. And last, but certainly not least, because she's a powerhouse, and if you haven't met her, you need to talk with her, is Brenda Berg. She is the president and CEO of Best NC, which stands for Business for Educational Success and Transformation a nonpartisan organization. Here it says over 90, but I'm pretty sure you've surpassed 100. Yeah. Um, businesses, business leaders with a focus on making education in North Carolina the best in the nation. She has over 20 years of experience as a business owner, public policy professional, and education advocate. She founded Scandinavian Child in 2002, a baby products manufacturing and importing business. Prior to founding her business, she had almost 10 years of public policy experience in both education and transportation policy and programs. Her passion for education stems from her own experience as a first generation college graduate. And just as background, I'll be moderating. I'm not as important as these folks, but I'm Tracy Zimmerman, <laughs> and I'm the executive director of the North Carolina Early Childhood Foundation. As I was reading your bios, I realized I neglected to introduce myself. So welcome to all of you. And as you're listening to the presentations, I have a challenge for you. I want you to think about your role. What can you do when you go home? What can you do within your organization? Who can you bring to the table? 
What tables do you need to be at? Where are the opportunities and how will you seize them? So with that, I'm gonna invite Chris up to share a little bit about uh, her work and invest in us. Thanks, Chris. And I'm just gonna sit here while you talk. Okay. <laughs> Don't touch the Velcro. <laughs> it's, okay. it's gonna, by the time the talk's over, the whole thing will be gone. <laughs> I'm gonna work on it. Yeah, exactly. Hi. Um, I have wanted to come to this conference for 15 years. Um, I don't know why I never made it here when I was in California, since it didn't seem that far away, but I guess it was, it did, it was too far away. Um, friends got to come, and uh, folks I've admired for years were speakers here, and here I finally am, and it's really, really great. Thanks for inviting uh, uh, Tracy, inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, I'm gonna spend less than 10 minutes trying to give you a really fast overview of FFYF and Invest in Us, and then I think before this session's over, we'll have a chance to give more specific examples or tie it to work that you may be doing here so that it, you leave understanding how you could be a part of one or both of these um, efforts. Really appreciate the introduction, Tracy, and I wanted to start off by saying, First Five Years Fund was funded or founded eight years ago by eight foundations, and they have continued to fund this for that length of time. Here it is, 2015, and they have stuck together through thick and thin, and everybody here knows that the early childhood political fight has just gotten more and more and more intense. Um, we have had to do everything from reauthorize Head Start more than once to figure out how to get right, race to the top early learning challenge grants out to states like you, how to do preschool development grants, how to do something about early Head Start and childcare, et cetera, et cetera. And that work is done not only by First Five Years Fund, but by so many groups in Washington. But the reason for First Five Years Fund to be launched by these foundations, Gates, Kellogg, Buffett, Pit Pritzker, Harris, et cetera, was to be more nimble and hard hitting and frankly just more explicitly political in its approach to advocacy. I don't know that that's news here or anybody doesn't already do that here, but in Washington what had been more typical was that you would belong to an association, you would teach Head Start and belong to the Head Start Association, you'd be an educator of young children, you'd belong to NACI. Or you were administering a particular federal fund, such as CCDBG, and you would be very, very interested in what National Women's Law Center had to say about that. First Five Years Fund is focused more broadly on a goal that brings more quality and access to children birth to five, particularly those living in poverty. It's a much bigger tent, a bigger umbrella, and it allows us to be much more opportunistic when we think about all of the different funding, partners, champions, et cetera, who could help on this. And it isn't tied to an association or a voting group. It's really just tied to a handful of funders who care deeply about the federal investments increasing each year in all of the programs I just named. And one of the major focus areas of the First Five Years Fund now is on figuring out how to take advantage of this window we're in right now while presidential campaigns are being launched literally every day. Um, and the work that we're trying to do is not only on the policy side, is not only hill facing and administration facing, but it's public facing. And presidential campaigns are public facing for many, many months and only one person wins. So by the end of this process, we hope that whoever goes to the Oval Office will be accountable to all of us about early childhood education and increasing those federal investments so that the um, field will be supported by whomever goes in. Also, First Five Years Fund is working closely on a new program called Invest in Us, which is um, powered by us, but it's a new um, effort to raise visibility and bring more people into the space of early childhood education advocacy. It is mostly a, a project of the White House and First Five Years Fund right now, but our intention is for this to go on and on way past this current administration. And that's why it's really fortunate that First Five Years Fund actually is hosting Invest in Us for right now. The brands, both Invest in Us and First Five Years Fund, I have to give a tip of the hat to Mr. Neiman over here <laughs> who had the vision and um, creativity to think of both of these. And as you can see, they're, they're really holding up well. Um, the, they're both now many years old, but they seem very current and fresh and interesting. And the simplicity 
that you see with this marketing and material in this image is that it really allows us to, to speak to all kinds of people on the right, on the left, in the states, in Washington. The point here is to create the very biggest tent we can to support what the president has been saying recently in his speeches. The problem is we're still not reaching enough kids. And we're not reaching them in time. And that has to change. Research shows that one of the best investments we can make in a child's life is high quality early education. Last year, I asked this Congress to help states make high-quality pre-K available to every four-year-old. And as a parent, as well as a president, I repeat that request tonight. But in the meantime, 30 states have raised pre-K funding on their own. They know we can't wait. So just as we worked with states to reform our schools, this year we'll invest in new partnerships with states and communities across the country in a race to the top for our youngest children. And as Congress decides what it's going to do, I'm going to pull together a coalition of elected officials, business leaders, and philanthropists willing to help more kids access the high-quality pre-K that they need. It is right for America. We need to get this done. The President was really clear on that day and has been on a number of other occasions about the importance of elected officials, business leaders, philanthropists, and the public coming together to create bigger investments and public-private partnerships to get more children into high-quality early learning programs. There is an overarching commitment of this administration to help children be successful in school and in life, and as recently as yesterday and today, the President is talking a lot about My Brother's Keeper, and that organization now is spinning off and going off to hopefully survive this administration and help children in the future. But it was launched by the White House, and we think that Invest in Us is kind of a similar effort by the White House to start raising visibility, creating new partnerships, and, and getting more people involved, whether or not they're there. Um, at the summit that was hosted in December, um, the White House invited many leaders that were, um, as you can see here, business leaders, foundation leaders, and labor leaders, superintendents, mayors, etc. Everybody there had a different story to tell about why they wanted to invest in early childhood. Manny Chirico from um, the Phillips and Hughes Corporation, that they have, you know, Calvin Klein and many other clothing lines, was there to say it's just good business sense for him to, to care about this issue. His employees respond to it. It gives him an opportunity to talk about how a company can invest. There was uh, Carol Larson from the Packard Foundation, J.B. Pritzker from the Pritzker Foundation, as you can see here, Secretary Matthews from Health and Human Services, who is responsible for administering Head Start, Early Head Start, CCDBG, et cetera. The presence of all of them there that day was a very powerful moment in our movement, and I think one that hopefully will encourage an increase in not only public will, but in public demand. And this is an area where I know North Carolina is sitting worrying and wondering how it will go from public will to public demand. You have been at the very, very highest levels of quality. You have been a national leader as a state on early childhood education, and you've also had to suffer setbacks led by different groups with different priorities. It wasn't so much that they were trying to change your trajectory, but they were very busy advocating for a different set of priorities, which directly impacted your ability to do what you needed to do in North Carolina. And that same story is happening in Washington, D.C. all the time. So what we have to do is raise public awareness and give people something to act on quickly. We talked about this before the summit, or the, the panel today, and realize that it's really one thing to get people interested and excited like all of you. In fact, I'm speaking to the choir right now, but I think you're sitting there wondering, so what do I do next? How do I go from where I am to the next thing? And I think Invest in Us is going to be one of the vehicles we can use to move from where we are to where we need to be. With the leader of the free world right there with us right now, people hopefully running to replace him and, sitting, and who want to sit in the Oval Office will get there and know that they are going to have to do even more than this administration. You certainly wouldn't be expected to do less. And the way that we can do that is by inviting new high visibility, high profile partners like Shakira, Jennifer Garner, Julianne Moore, 
John Legend and others, athletes and other kinds of celebrities, really we hope to recruit more and more of them to lend their name and voice to this campaign. We hope to partner with more and more corporations. You would expect to see Scholastic and Disney because they sell products to children, but we want to partner with companies that you don't expect to, to care about this issue so that we get a bigger, wider swath of corporate America involved in this, caring about it and speaking up about it within their own companies and elsewhere. What we have specifically laid out for Invest in Us are in days of action, a few things, first of all, days of action, where a number of groups, particularly those in the nonprofit space who can't donate tens of millions of dollars to a project like a foundation can, to instead tell us that on a number of days during a calendar year, they'll do something in their location to draw attention to this issue. One example, a month or so ago, uh, public television aired the Nick Kristoff documentary and they hosted a Q&A with Jennifer Garner after that because she was included in that documentary. So just to give you a sense of how wide ranging the options are, one of the things Tracy asked you to think about is what can you do next? So be thinking about what you do every day and whether the organization you work in or partners you have could do a day of action in a way that draws attention to what's happening in North Carolina or what you would like to be done differently so that you're adding your voice to the Invest in Us chorus. Also, as a leader, you could be working very, very hard on developing your own narrative and creating your own data points and getting to a point where the, the North Carolina story is a unified, disciplined story. You've had a long history. You have a long story. You may not all agree on the story, but what we've learned in Washington over these last few years since the president proposed the $75 billion increase in early learning is the faster we could come together and the more disciplined and unified we could be in what we advocated for, the more successful we would be. And that's been true. You'll think back, I hope, to uh, the end of fiscal year 2014, or I should say calendar year, when everybody else lost in Washington, but early childhood won. We've got Sequester cuts restored to Head Start, $800 million, $500 million more for that, plus we reauthorized McPhee, plus we added a little bit of money to preschool development grants, et cetera, coming out with a $1.4 billion increase, which was the direct result of taking the charge led by the President in January, fighting all year with all of you to get to the point where people in Congress felt like they kind of had to do something to help us with our effort. And Invest in Us is going to build from that place. Now going forward, as I mentioned, there are lots of people running for president. And there could be 10 more people on this slide right now, or at least four more since yesterday when we made it. Um, I'm announcing. And Rich is going to be running. So we all know you'd be accountable to us on early childhood. Maybe. Uh, but we're really, really excited about the prospect of utilizing all of the resources that they're going to expend on their campaigns to carry our message. And one way you do that is you literally hire people to go into each of those campaigns with briefing books, data, polls, et cetera, research on them and on other people, and you help them understand the issue, but also through the lens of their own history and the history of the other candidates. Again, I, I share that as a, another thing you could be doing here. You probably do do that here with your legislative um, candidates, et cetera, but we're going to be doing it very aggressively in the next couple of months because we think that they sit in a unique position to help convert public will to public demand as candidates. So they're going to drown out almost any other noise that's going on in the space for a while, and we want to tie Invest in Us and our message to those campaigns both sides of the aisle to see if we can't get a little more traction and a little more accountability. That's a very brief overview of FFYF and Invest in Us, and I hope that as the panel progresses, we'll be able to talk more. Thank you. And we at the North Carolina Early Childhood Foundation are very proud to be a nonprofit partner. We're officially up on the website now of Invest in Us, so that's exciting. Yeah. For us. Um, so Chris, you know, the last week's paper actually, uh, our political columnist uh, Rob Christensen 
uh, was talking about how North Carolina is no longer a flyover state because we've moved our, our Republican primary up and so there's lots of candidates that are coming through and will be coming through for the duration. <laughs> um, what might you suggest of how people could take advantage of that specific opportunity? What could they do as individuals and what could they encourage their organizations to do? Great question. You're not a flyover state at all. Um, <laughs> and I think that it, we would say this for either candidate, so whether they're Republicans or Democrats, but since Republicans will be here first, what we've been finding out through not only polling but from a lots of individual visits is that Republicans are particularly supportive of home visiting programs and birth to three programs. So for any of you out there that are running those or if you've been supported by MCV, I think you want to you want to flag that as something that you don't want to lose that's important to you. And the same is true about raising the quality of childcare through early Head Start standards. So I think birth to three is a really good place to go. The second thing that's really good to emphasize is that you support parent choice, that parents have the option to take children to different centers, different providers, they have some flexibility in your system. That's a very appealing um, uh, proposal to make. But then last but not least, I would say, be sure and say that you are one of the leading states on this issue. You were the first state to get a race to the top challenge grant, that you've built QRIS into your licensing standards, that you fully expect children in North Carolina to be ready to succeed and compete when they enter kindergarten, and you need their help, um, that this is good for North Carolina. It's good for business, it's good for kids, it's good for families. And so I'd stay at those kind of high level issues while drawing in some of the specifics about your state and do not take no for an answer. If you call a campaign office and say, I hear your candidate's coming, I want, a, I want some time. If they don't give you time, go to an event where they're speaking and ask questions, raise your hand, coordinate among yourselves so that you're deploying, you're not duplicating. I think you should really try hard to push your issue with anybody that comes. Thank you, that was great advice. All right, next up we have Rich, and he's gonna be talking about pre-K our way. I only have two slides, so this should go really fast and well. Uh, thanks for having me here. I'm actually filling in for a great person. His name is Sam Crane. Sam was the uh, treasurer, uh, was a former state treasurer of New Jersey, and this is a person who knows where money is in the state and how to get it. Uh, Sam is also good friends and a counselor to a man named Brian Marr of Marr Terminals. Uh, Brian Marr's family owned Marr Terminals, which was the big stevedoring and container ship unpacking uh, operation in New Jersey. Uh, he sold that business, and when he did, he decided to get into the business of early childhood education, and he created a preschool in the Ironbound District of New Jersey, which is a, a vulnerable population of largely Portuguese and Brazilian um, immigrants in New Jersey who are right behind the train station in, um, in New Jersey, right behind the Penn Station in New Jersey. He created this uh, preschool place and then when there was a development grant, an ERA grant under the, um, under the uh, Obama administration, he expanded it with his own personal money to create basically a birth to five center using early Head Start funding and his own funding and money from the Ironbound uh, develop Community Development District. So here is a guy who's tremendously um, committed to a birth to five framework. And he looked at it and he looked at Sam and he said, you know, Sam, I could build five more centers, but that's not gonna solve the problem in New Jersey. The problem in New Jersey is that we have a great preschool program and we have a law in the books that says that this preschool program should be expanded to 91 to 90 com additional communities in New Jersey. And the state legislature has been sitting on that money and we have to do a campaign to spring that money loose. And that campaign became this, Pre-K Our Way. So I'd like to tell you that story. Um, in New Jersey, the Supreme Court mandated uh, preschool in 31 districts, and it was called the Abbott decision, and they are now called Abbott preschools. Um, and the result of that is probably one of the nation's best three and four year old preschool programs. The numbers that come back to it, come back from it that are analyzed by NEAR and other places 
uh, show tremendous gains for these children and uh, who are able to get them. Yet in New Jersey, there's a little bit of resentment because you have parents in other districts who are not able to avail themselves of these programs, and certainly additional districts in New Jersey need these programs. In fact, almost every child in New Jersey needs this program in some way, whether or not they're subsidized or they're not subsidized. So the challenge of it was is that Abbott was created by the courts, and the public never really had a chance to debate it. They never really had a chance to talk and decide about the value of early childhood education. And so as a result, what there isn't, it, there is a huge demand to expand the programs. And yet what we know from New Jersey, where the average cost of childcare and preschool is probably approaching $13,000 on the private market per year per child, that parents very much value it and they're actually moving into districts that offer these types of programs and help specifically to get them. Um, so what we decided to do was to leverage the money that Brian would have invested in, program, in, in a new center into a, into a campaign that actually raised public demand that would create, pub, create political will that would actually finally lead to the expansion of these programs that are mandated by law but have never been funded, I guess, because there's not a bridge you can close in New Jersey in order to do it. Um, okay, that's my partisan shot for the day. How to get that in, okay. So we developed this program called Pre-K Our Way, and the way we did it was through a lot of planning and research. We went out and figured out how you could get support from basically middle class and more affluent parents to expand a program that was originally meant and intended to serve disadvantaged kids, and we found out that it, that it was there. This program is run by people with political and business expertise advised by advocates on how to move this program forward. And I think that's really important because to have people who know how to move the politics and the policy and also bring in business money and bring in a lot of people from the left and the right and the grassroots and the grass tops, that's how you win. And so this campaign has a lot of muscle. The other thing is that it has a community organizing component that is so often missing from everything that we do. I, my company does social impact communications campaigns, and I'll tell you right now that it is not about how many likes you get and how many tweets you get and what you're doing out in social media. That's all really important, but if you don't have people on the ground demanding from elected officials that they get the programs and the resources they need to be effective parents and to make sure that their children are prepared for school and ready for success, you are not going to be successful. So this campaign has a very strong and organized community uh, organizing effort. And the reason why Sam couldn't be here today is because one of those efforts is going on now in um, Seaview, New Jersey, in southern New Jersey, to create people on the ground to do this, to create the 100 people in each area who are really going to influence the legislators uh, to move this forward. So this is really based on marketing and on research, and it's based on an actionable theory of change, right? So what is your actionable theory of, what is our actionable theory of change? We're not trying to do everything at once. Um, everybody on this campaign, from the advocates who are consulting with us, to Brian Marr, to Sam Crane, to our firm, s totally and completely believe in that education starts at birth and we need birth to five services. But our research showed us that the public would only go so far as to push for additional funding for preschool. So we started with preschool. And we started with this law that was already there and sitting on the books. And we started with the public outrage that was there, that this law for a great program to help kids really have the opportunity to be prepared for school and ready for success is not being funded while a whole bunch of other things are being funded in the state. So we decided not to start with the perfect, but with the practical, of, and that would help us create the public and the policy and the political pressure to do what we wanted to do. And we have a balanced approach. We have grassroots, we have grass tops, we have people on the left, and we have people on the right, and we're in this for the long haul. 
our plan, and this is funded basically for four years at least, our plan, our intermediate plan, is to influence the next governor and the next legislature to try and get a big win. So this is really an involved program with a lot of muscle. Um, and we've only been out in the public for 90 days. And in that time, we, we have a huge bipartisan leadership committee um, headed by Tom Kane, the former Republican governor, and Jim Florio, the former Democratic governor, as well as a lot of business interests in the states. All the major foundations in the state are, are also doing it. We're getting press attention, we're reaching out to legislators, and we're currently organizing our own field soldiers in the, uh, out there. And our rallying cry is precisely this, bring pre-K our way. We've waited too long, we're not waiting any longer, and we want you to bring pre-K our way into our community. It's time for our community to be served. So we're not starting from a statewide basis that, we, where, that people are crying for a statewide system. We're starting locally with local people saying, you bring my pre-K my way, I want it. When everybody in each of the local 90 local communities demands it, then you have an expansion of a statewide system. So here are the lessons we learned on it as you go through and think about planning your own campaigns and your community outreach, that preparation is essential, including public opinion research. You have to find out where people are and you have to fundamentally believe that you are a freak of nature when it comes to early childhood development. You know so much more than the average person that you have to figure out what they know and how you can build that bridge between what you know and what they know and what they want so that you can get them behind you and start where they are so you can move them to where you want them to be. You have to develop realistic objectives. One or two goals is good enough and you have to have intermediate objectives. One of our goal, intermediate objectives is inside New Jersey, there is a whole bunch of funding for education that is, if it isn't spent, goes into the general fund. And so what we're demanding is that money go back and be spent on education to put a, a political pressure point on there. The other thing is that you really have to stick to your message and your focus. And this is something that Sam uh, Crane and Brian are extremely insistent about. They are controlling this program and they're asking people, do you want to come and join? And people are saying, well, I'd like to join, but I need you to do this and I need you to do that and I need you to do this. And they say, we're not doing that. What we're doing is this. And when you're ready to do this, you're welcome to come join us but we're not going to do that. And what has happened with that attitude, instead of trying to make everybody happy, they've made people come in and be happy about joining a very focused effort because they know at the end of it that this group is gonna try and help them reach their objectives as well. So they've, they've really um, stuck to that, and, but they've left the door open. They've gone to, and people have talked to them and made demands of them and they say, we're not doing that, but when you're ready, come back and you're perfectly welcome here and those groups have come back and now they have a very, very strong group. So let me talk to you finally about the, um, the rules of the game as we see them. How do you do this? Um, you don't wanna try and do everything because you're gonna end up with nothing. Right? And the problem is, is that a lot of people who work in this field are progressives and progressives believe that you have to build a perfect system in order to have perfect outcomes. Uh, that's great. The problem is by the time you build a perfect system and you've lined up all your ducks in a row, somebody has come by and eaten every single one of them, okay? <laughs> you've got to start with two ducks who can create two other ducks. So you're gonna need two ducks of the opposite sex. That's perfection. Like, teach them how to make more ducks, right? Um, I, I, the only thing I know about ducks is how to eat them in orange sauce, but that's okay. Uh, you have to have a plan and stick to it, and then be opportunistic enough to seize these opportunities. What's out there? Politics, everything's always changing. So this is what we're doing, and when we have an opportunity come up, we all sit down and say, okay, wait a second. 
Are we being reactive? Are we being proactive? How does this fit into our theory of change? How does this make us go farther? Although this is a well-funded campaign, so the funds are fairly limited given the, the size of the state and the number of the communities we're doing. So that's what we do. And you have to remember that where you start is not where you're going to end up, and you don't really know where you're going to end up. So you have to be able to kind of play it around and feel it. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect to make progress. I know I'm repeating myself, but if you come away from anything from here, it's that you don't have to be perfect to create progress. It just has to be really good and focused. And then the other is play to make the impossible probable. When I started working in early childhood uh, development seven years ago with the Heckman equation, um, people said it was impossible to ever get this on a president's agenda, and then all of a sudden it is. Now that happened through a lot of hard work, but it happened because we made people imagine that that was possible. And then people like Chris and others worked really, really hard to make it probable. And so you have to be out there. You never know when that opportunity is going to present itself and don't fall into the trap that there is no money out there, therefore we can't do anything. I can't think of a state that has a worse fiscal problem than New Jersey and we're still out there pounding away. And why do we pound away? Because money goes where the will is and it's not <coughs> rational. If there's public will demanding on politicians that the public has a priority, the politicians make it their priority. You move right to the top. One message, one ask, hammering away makes it a priority for them, and that's what you have to do. So money is going to be there. And this, in this country, there is, don't let anybody tell you there isn't money because all you have to do is drive around and you see the money in cars and in clothes and in entertainment and everything else. What's not there are the right priorities. You are out there to set the right priorities and get some of that money for your programs and your kids. And then finally, advocacy is a contact sport, right? Go out there, get bruised, bruise other people, talk to people <laughs> who aren't like you, get up in their face, make them see you sweat, make them smell your breath, and <laughs> demand, absolutely demand, sweat equity from them, right? If you can't see 500 faces in your head that are surrounding the elected officials that you need to create progress from, then you don't, are not making contact. You have to physically know what those people look, at, look like, what they like, and how you can get to their likes and to their values to promote the values of their program. So that's it for me, and thank you very much. Thank you, Rich. Um, I want to follow up on something uh, you really pointed to. So I think it's, I think you all would agree, it's fair to say that we are not great at uh, uniting around one single policy. Is that fair? Yeah. Yes. So <laughs> I heard yes, yeah, so I'm taking it. So um, can you say a little bit more about, so for those organizations that initially may have had concerns, what was it that brought them back to the table and what um, how were you also able to keep them uh, from maybe really going astray, creating more backlash, if you will? Uh, to be perfectly honest, the way you do it is with communication dollars and a concerted effort. Basically, if you're out there with a lot of money communicating, it does two things. One, it makes people understand that you're serious and they need to be in the room with you and they need to contend with what you're going to do. So they're going to want to be in the room with you and be an active participant because they either want to be your friend or they want to hold you close as an enemy. And I, I don't know how else to say that, but at least you have them in the room. The other thing is, is that it's really clear that you can overwhelm them with your communications capacity. So, and what that means is that um, in hard terms, they can talk all they want, but your voice is stronger. And so, and that may sound mean-spirited and not cooperative, 
But the plain fact is, is that we have a lot of kids out there who need help, and we have to make progress now. And so I'm willing to be a little bit mean-spirited and uncooperative in order to, cr to create the types of outcomes that are out there. I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to win, right? Um, so within that context, you don't want to alienate people, so we hold the door open. And I, I always tell people, don't create a coalition. A coalition is the most horrible <laughs> thing you can ever have in your life. It's like I see uh, eyes literally mm -hmm. popping out of people's mm -hmm. heads at the moment, Rich. A, a coalition is like having dysentery and cholera at the same time. <laughs> oh my God, this is on camera. I'm never going to work again. <laughs> okay, but here's the thing: don't have a coalition. Have a collaboration. So what you say to people is, "This is the direction we're going in," and somebody will say, "Well, I can't go in this direction because this policy. We're all about this policy, and that should be your number one priority." And you say, "Okay, well, you know, you can step aside, and you can choose to do what you do, and you can choose not to bring this to your board and put your name on it and participate." But we have a group of five or seven people within this collaboration who are willing to do that, so they're going to go forward. And once you do that, it's a whole different situation. You can get the ball rolling, and then eventually you can keep in your back of your mind, I really do need that group there. So now that we've got this rolling, how do I bring them back in, and maybe I can give them this larger thing and, and work with them. Thanks, Rich. All right, so next we have um, Brenda, and um, so we're going from a specific policy to really a comprehensive vision and how to bring that uh, to life. So I'm going to see if I'll turn the light off. Maybe not. All right, sorry. I'm trying to close it. It's not closing. There. No. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Good. My voice doesn't carry very well. I'm sorry you've been sitting and, and listening, so I'll, I'll, um, I'll make it even quicker than Rich in the sense that I don't even have one slide. Um, <laughs> I went analog, so the pieces in your, in your seat come from uh, Best NC. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much, Tracy. We are um, um, humbled uh, by being invited to be on this particular panel. Um, and more, more importantly, I'm humbled to speak in front of all of you um, because sort of like Rich, you talked about the importance of business and, and philanthropists and, and policy makers coming together. That's sort of, that's the role of Best NC. But we are not the content experts. So I'm not going to stand up here and tell you even square one about what you're doing, what you're working on that's so incredibly important. But I will talk a little bit about what we are doing here in North Carolina to try to convene a very comprehensive, while allowing um, each individual um, initiative to have its strong voice within a comprehensive vision for education in North Carolina. Um, first, before I get further into that, just to get a sense, who's from not from North Carolina in the room? Oh, a lot. Wow. Okay. So with if my so the rest would be from North Carolina, <laughs> which is what 80%, 70%. So I wanted to make sure that we're, we're recognizing that some of this is within the context of North Carolina, um, but it's inspired, what the work we're doing is inspired by the work that other business groups have done in other states. Um, notably, one, one is uh, the Massachusetts Business Alliance for Education in Massachusetts, which formed 26 years ago. Um, and when we think of Massachusetts as having the best education system in the nation, it's because of the business community coming together and having an independent voice for education. There was a kind of a activist judge that had a role in that as well, but, um, but they really set a vision for education in North Carolina that the state could then get behind and were inspired by that incredibly important work. Uh, where we have departed from what they did and what Tennessee SCORE has done in Tennessee and some others is that the business community in that sense tends to work on a vision of K-12. And we don't believe that education starts at kindergarten. I don't even believe it starts at pre-K. We believe it starts with healthy birth weight, families, early learning, um, and the entire uh, continuum. And it, of course, doesn't end with 12, right? There's the, and so we are truly a cradle-to-career 
uh, organization, advocacy organization. We think it's really, really important to look at the entire continuum. And in terms of getting the business community engaged, they want to see that entire continuum as well because the closer you get to that career readiness, the closer you get to their employees and their customers, right? But you can also help engage those business leaders by, by backtracking. Um, people ask, well, why business? Um, I think you mentioned um, businesses sometimes that get involved because they have a monetary interest. Well, our members don't. Uh, the members of Best NC, which is over 100 of the top CEOs and business owners in the state, are businesses like Blue Cross Blue Shield, Bank of America, Lowe's, Belk, AT&T, companies that deeply care about how well education, the education system is preparing the, the population of North Carolina, um, which is incredibly important because when I walk in the door as an education advocate, I'm not advocating for a program or funding or, or anything other than the, the well-being of our, our state, which gives us a unique position. So we've done a couple of things. Best NC is only a year and a half old. So powerhouse would not be the word <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I would use. Um, but we have built a very strong um, coalition Friendships. Better. <laughs> As one of my board members says, friends with all allies with none. Um, but we have, um, we have developed very strong friendships al along the entire continuum. Um, there are two things that we've, we've done so far that I think are incredibly important. Um, one is, when I first started off in this role, I found myself arguing facts. How many of you spend your time arguing facts? Who here wants to start arguing ideas? So I've put out our Facts and Figures book. It's just the first edition. We plan on renewing it. But it was such a simple thing to do, and I think that it's really important um, to sort of always have those facts with you. Um, and we're finding, I'm down at the legislature often, and I'm finding in committee hearings where legislators are pulling those books out. It's a much more productive conversation. But the second, which I think is, is the reason I'm here to talk, is to talk about visioning for education and helping getting people together across the state um, to really share a, a shared vision. Um, we've pulled together over 400 of the top education stakeholders in the state to start the process, and we'll continue to um, convene across the state. Um, and what you have in front of you is the, the very, very high-level overview. Um, the purpose for the vision is twofold. One is we won't know how to get where we want to go if we don't figure out where we're trying to get to. Um, and, and as part of that, it's really important that we tear down the silos, right? I see a lot of nodding heads. So you'll notice that when we took all of everyone's sort of hopes and dreams for education in North Carolina, they came down to three things. We need to support students. We need to elevate educators, and we need to raise expectations. Do you hear pre-K in any one of those, or all three of those, right? Do you hear community colleges in any one of those, and all, or all three of those? So it was really important to us that we started, well, when you get further into the vision, <coughs> I agree with Rich, you need to be very specific, but we also need to be seeing how each of our individual initiatives are going to fit into a broader vision and so we can stop having these pieces fighting against each other. The first time I sat down with President Ross from the university system, and you've heard they've suffered some, some budget cuts lately, I asked him what, is the, what are the three things that we can fight for that will help the university system. First thing, stop the cuts. Second thing, early learning. The president of the university system, if he can say that, we can all say that. So it was really to help um, kind of tear that down and redefine education across the entire continuum. The other thing we achieved from this process is we didn't just bring in the choir, the usual choir. We brought in people who actually intentionally, um, we, who disagreed on points. So to set the vision, we, we established 18 working groups 
kind of sliced up education to then pull it back together. Each of the working group co-chairs were a Republican and a Democrat, or a pro and a con. Um, there's been a big debate about Common Core. The, the, the standards working group was co-chaired by the anti-Common Core leader and the pro-Common Core, one of the pro-Common Core heads, and they co-chaired. I could have sold tickets to some of these. <laughs> Um, and we, when we sent out the all call, and there are several people in this room, Nancy Brown, you participated in it, Pam Dowdy, um, Cedric, the NC Justice Center, signed up and was part of it. Um, we um, got 325 people to sign up, many of them in multiple working groups. And when we came to the table and had a conversation about early learning, we brought to the table some of the more controversial topics and put them out on the table. Um, and we were very intentional about those conversations. We were very deliberate about those conversations. And, and Rich talked about the importance of kind of sticking to it and getting in their face. And the starting point for that conversation is where do we have common ground? Every single person in this room cares deeply about children. So if you can start that conversation with we all care deeply about children, you will get to a point where you disagree. But at least you started that conversation on where you agree. So here we are. Those working groups happen in the fall. Uh, we're working now at the legislature with uh, their current agendas. And it's paying back already. It's paying back already because we have friends from both sides who respect the process. And so we've put forward um, recommendations that have have been a little bit controversial, and people have said, you know, but the process, we all agreed, you know, we all came to consensus on this, on this particular point. So I think that that effort of, of pulling people together intentionally, who, uh, who you think oppose, to understand it. And I'll give one quick example, and I know we're, we've got uh, time, but um, okay. have any of you heard of, in North Carolina, there's been a claim about the fading effect, right? So. I was confused by this. And I kind of went in and dug around because I, I found myself saying, there's no fading effect. I'm going to defend pre-K. Well, what I found is it wasn't an indictment of pre-K. It was an indictment of K-3. And I think we get lost in the, I'm going to prove to you that I'm right. I'm going to prove to you that pre-K is the best. Well, it could be. But if we have students who are coming out of a wonderful pre-K environment and they're coming into a not wonderful K-3 environment, it is a fading effect. And so if that's the language that they're speaking, let's start with that. And let's look at third grade reading and help get everyone on board with the fact that the entire continuum from a healthy birth weight to third grade literacy, every single piece is part of a collective Right? If we can get everyone, I think it's wonderful now that there's a stake in the ground that says third grade reading is important. And so now we can reach into all of the resources that we have here at the table. Tracy's the, the campaign for grade level reading. We can start pulling into that and, and getting people to see this as it's not early childhood educators against home visiting. You can see how it's an and, it's not an or proposition. So I'm really excited about that. And I hope that each of you in your own personal advocacy and the work that you do really spend some time trying to understand that the person who you're fighting against, there's got, there has to be some common ground. I have yet to meet anyone who hates children. <laughs> <laughs> I, haven't, I have yet. So let's start there. And then you can work your way. And so far, so good. We're, we're seeing some great results. But again, the content of it is thanks to all of you and all the work, hard work you do. So as you hear more about Best NC or you see opportunities where you can help us, I would also invite you to please provide us with all of your, your knowledge and your, your skills because we can only do great advocacy advocating for great work. So thank you. Thank you so much, Brenda. That was fantastic. And I have a follow-up question for you around, you know, you spoke about that uh, a lot of groups, business groups, were starting at kindergarten, and you recognize that you really need to start at birth. So since there are a lot of folks who are also not from North Carolina, what advice would you give them in approaching business groups to, th to encourage them to start earlier? I, I think it's starting with whatever their hook is. 
mm -hmm. right? So each and every single one of my members comes in into it from up one per, w at one point along that whole continuum. So AT&T, for example, and they'll have uh, 300 applicants to sort through before they can get to one viable candidate for some basic entry-level positions. So if you take that, okay, that's your, your position, well, let's pull back, right? We know that if you're not reading by grade level in third grade, you're likely not to be prepared. If you're not born at a healthy birth weight or you don't have early learning. So if we can start from wherever they're starting mm -hmm. from and move backwards, that's sort of the way we've been able to get people on board um, along the entire continuum and it's respectful of where they're starting from. We do have members who start from third grade. We have members who start from you know pre-K and um, if we can get everyone along the whole continuum, I think we're, we get a better richer depth, but again, we're working at the state level. Right. So we want that breadth um, of, of advocacy. Um, we don't, we, we have your group to zero in on a more specific right. piece of the puzzle. Thank you, I think, well you, you hit an important point that I make when I'm giving presentations about messaging and what is actually the first basic rule of messaging. Let's see if Rich agrees with me since we know he's the guru here, <laughs> is listening. What is it? What are the values of who you're talking to so that you can actually be heard in what it is you want to say? So you really reinforce that. that list, it starts with listening and then tapping into what people care about, not what we care about. So um, this is the most exciting part, I think, which is you get to ask questions of these great, fabulous people. So for those of you who have a question, you can just come to the center and um, to the microphone there, and we'll, we'll get started. Just uh, if you would say your name and uh, maybe what organization and state you're with. Yes, my name is Bill Anderson. I'm the executive director for MECED in Charlotte. MECED's a local education advocacy group. And I wanna speak to our friend, uh, the gentleman on the panel, who mentioned that uh, we need to be comfortable with getting in people's faces, we need to be comfortable in letting them smell our breath. Um, <laughs> They're going to be quoted, North, right? Unfortunately, in North Carolina, we have southern manners. And a lot of people are really uncomfortable with that. But the reality is what's happened in our state, as our state had been for many years a very progressive state. We had a governor who was the education governor. And we have taken a significant turn in the opposite direction. And that's fueled by tax cuts that have been huge for the past couple of years. They have clearly affected monies that come to the university, to the public schools, the community college, and for pre-K. That being said, how do you go up to somebody, uh, a legislator who thinks like this and has this ideology, how do you get them to change their mind and let them know that these things aren't free and they cost money? Well, the, the simple answer is to go back to what um, everybody was saying about value proposition. Can anybody tell me the three things that uh, policymakers are most concerned about? Okay, getting elected, getting reelected, and raising the money to get either elected or reelected. <laughs> well, but the thing is, is that not increasing taxes or that that whole thing comes from a way to get elected and and to get reelected, right? So basically, there, there are two things. One is public will that tells them that, the, that money should be spent in a particular way. This is my money, my tax dollars. I want it going here. The other is not just you telling these people, but a lot of other people who are giving them money and providing them with support and talking to other people on their behalf to get elected or reelected. Those are the people who also need to be in their face and, and getting uh, in their grills. And so basically that's your leverage point of changing the, the equation here. And to tell you the truth, you know, you had an election, the last election, where had someone not been beheaded in, by ISIS, Kay Hagan might have won that race. And the reason is, is because our research showed that um, research showed that North Carolina, the entire campaign was going to be decided on precisely the issue you were talking about, about in the state legislature's investments or lack of investment in education. And there was a lot of dissatisfaction and then suddenly something happened in the world 
that got people thinking about something in terms of foreign policy and my own personal protection, and so it went away. So what I would say is heading into the next few years, the biggest concern, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or whatever, is about the education of children in North Carolina, and it always has been that way. And so what you need to do is really make sure there's a very strong foundation of support um, on the left, on the right, grass to, grassroots, grass tops, mm -hmm. to make sure that a single event in the media can't derail the public's focus on your issue. Brenda, is there anything you'd like to add since you're, you're in the halls regularly? I, yes, <laughs> I, would, I would love to. Um, and um, Bill, you do such an incredible job, as you know. We're, we're big fans of, of your work. And one thing you do really well is you advocate for things. And you're very intentional and very specific about what you advocate for. And that's the effort, that's, that's the approach that we have been taking in our advocacy is, as Rich said, the money's there. Or if not there, it can be, it can be, it can be there, right? And so in, in our advocacy work, we, we try to get them hooked on great ideas, right? And um, I talked about kind of that continuum. Right now we're working on a continuum of teachers being recruited and supported and developed and principals in the whole talent pipeline. When we look at the birth to third grade reading continuum, we get people excited about that entire um, bucket because then you, you're doing two things. You're advocating for something that they want to then fund. We typically talk about the dollars after we get them excited about it. And, and two, you're not robbing Peter to pay Paul in the process. Right, because we don't want them to fund one piece of that continuum. We want it all to be um, one entire continuum. So advocating for things, getting them hooked on it, and then, oh, and by the way, there's a price tag attached to it. Great, thank you. Other questions, please, you, you're, you can uh, form a line if you'd like. Uh, come right on up. But Helen, <laughs> thanks, Helen. Uh, I'm Helen Gabriel, and I'm with Smart Start of Brunswick County. And, um, I have, well, I was going to actually even address the fact that it is kind of a soft-spoken industry. It's babies, puppies, butterflies, everything is beautiful. And so since people really don't hate children and babies, why is it such a hard sell? Is it all the money and the re-election piece of it? I just don't, I just don't see how it can be such a hard sell. I've worked in other nonprofits and I thought this would be a breeze. <laughs> so. That's what I don't really understand. And the second part is the two gentlemen in New Jersey. What made them come to the table? What was that hook? So thank you. Um, I don't, you know, Chris, I think that you're, you're best answering that, that first question about why they're not at the table and, and how you build a long-term movement. And I, I can answer the second one right now. Uh, Brian Marr was at the table because he looked at his grandchildren um, and his children. And he said, you know what, my family is very advantaged and I'm looking at how my children who are middle class or, or higher are struggling with just working two jobs and paying for childcare and wraparound services and everything else. And I can't imagine, imagine what it would be like for less advantaged families. And so, and this man is a, a Republican, okay? Uh, he, in New Jersey, Republicans tend to be moderate, but Brian is a businessman and he's a Republican and he needs like cost benefit analysis, he needs everything else and he feels that education starts at birch, birth. Sam Crane works for him and Sam will do what Brian wants him to do, but Sam also <laughs> believes in this uh, very deeply. And, and, and as do all the people around them, all the advocates and everything else. Um, what Brian did when people talk about meeting people where they are, stop talking about policy and get people to look at their own families first and say, okay, now imagine what it's like for somebody who doesn't have a car, who has to take the bus, who has to do this. Who ha all of a sudden you make a connection with people and then you can talk about how to build a wider movement. Kids don't vote. Um, I think you can go there, and then you think about the kids we're probably serving and how disenfranchised they are and their parents are. And so there's sort of a whole analysis you could do on 
who we help and how disempowered they are. But you could also do kind of a different look at this through the way American politics are unfolding in these last few years with Supreme Court ruling on Citizens United and the way that a few very wealthy individuals are really controlling a fair amount of domestic policy. And we don't know what their values really are around education. I think we're starting, we want, we want to find out. So we've got a combination of two things, an electorate, you know, or a, a constituency that we want to support who don't necessarily have a voice and they really don't have a voice now. Then we have to shift all of our advocacy efforts to be much more tailored to highly influential, high net worth individuals, which is not how we grew up. Um, if you think about, you know, any major social change, it's usually been a grassroots effort of some kind. But I don't know that that's the only strategy that's going to work anymore. So there's a level of sophistication around messaging and data and influence that is new to us in the early childhood advocacy space. And we have to learn to speak in these different rooms to these different people. I think Tracy and others have made this point the listening, but also being willing to assert the value of education with data and compelling stories at the same time. So I'll just end on saying there is research that shows the importance of blending the two. And when you have a data point, let's say our poll, for example, it's wonderful stuff, but you have to have a story to go with it to make it stick. And I know that all of you, no matter what state you're in, are dealing with these federal shortages of funds in really painful ways. That, that we need your stories to go with our data to create a narrative that will compel high net worth individuals to ask people running government to do something else. I know I had to connect a bunch of dots in that, but it's such a great question. And you're asking it because things have shifted seismically in only really one or two presidential terms. And we have, you know, one coming up. And so we're really working hard to find ways to get in rooms we've never even thought to get in before, but we have to. Great. Who else? Really? So, oh, please, right there. Phyllis, come on up. If you, oh, if you oh, is that what it is? Yeah, okay, it well, easier, could you yell. take a vote? I um, could take the mic around. <laughs> uh, so I'm Phyllis Barber. I'm from Wake County Smart Start, and my question is that um, the, there's a there's the moment when you meet a business leader or a community leader, and you see the potential for them to become a future champion. You can just sort of feel that they may, be, and maybe it's because they feel passionate about part of the issue. Maybe they're. Um, I've often said that when people are seem irritable in a meeting, it's because something conflictual is happening in their interpretation, but that can be an opportunity. It means that there's something, there's grit happening in their mind and they're trying to wrap their head around it, and I see that as an opportunity. Um, so both with people that are pro from the beginning and mixed from the beginning, what are concrete experiences that we can cultivate with these future leaders to get them from the point where you have the first meeting to the point where they might go into a legislative office and advocate. Um, we, are, we host a business board circle, we meet twice a year, and then we try to offer some uh, uh, enrichment opportunities for those leaders to gain knowledge. We've done something around labor and the impact of our work in affecting the uh, future workforce. And we've talked about the cost, the complex costs to provide services, and I'd like your ideas about what kinds of experiences you've done with leaders where you've come out of those meetings or those events and you felt like the leader came away with a great sense of value to their time being spent, because we're certainly respectful of their time, but also like that connection, and I do understand that it can be very individual to the specific business or industry. So I'll step down and take your hand. Yep. Brenda, why don't you start? Sure. Thanks. A um, um, couple of things. One, keep it simple. Really, 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 really simple. If you can keep it down to you know one graphic, an infographic goes a long way. And blending the data with stories is always some sort of human connection, but blended with the, the facts um, tends to be the most impactful communication tool. But with business people, we're busy, right? This is. 
um, uh, a matter of fact. The other is, though, you can't, you simply can never expect anyone to leave a, a conference or a presentation and then advocate proactively. It's, it might happen, might, but it is much better if you say, we need specifically this program or this amount of money in this line item and you need to speak with these few people in the next three days and you need to say the following things while you're at it. So the more, if you have those strong advocates, it is not okay, you know, e even if I say, well, can, can you give somebody a call? It, can you give, do you mind if I, I will send you their phone number, right? I will send you the talking points uh, or I will be there with you in the meeting. Um, it, it, there, there has to be a lot of, of hand-holding because business people, the more impactful the business person is, the more they're just busy. Um, the other, the second part of that is you do want cocktail party conversation. So very, very, very short, concise bullet points help with that piece of it where you're saying, if you're in a cocktail environment, you can have you know, this one data point, maybe two, but keep it really simple. Yeah, I would say the first thing you want to do is don't separate the business leader from the business, but to actually have the, try and get the business involved and create, have them ask or do things that create brand value for their business. Um, and then the other thing is to get them to understand what that brand value is and what it does for them, and th then the value of what you're doing, like tours and getting them introduced to people they're helping and them actually seeing it is a great way of getting them personally and then their business uh, invested. The other thing is exactly, you have to ask them to do something and you have to ask them to do something right, right away. As soon as you see that connection, you have to, have to ask them to do something. And the first thing you ask them to do should be fairly simple and it should be positive, right? So that they have a positive experience and then support that with media. So that you go back into the brand value that they're getting for their company and all of a sudden now they're seeing, oh, we're getting some good play on this thing that I've done. When you ask them to do something, it's what's called what we call a pressure test. Is this person really a champion for me and how far along are they? They can't like ask for this, then they're not farther along. I have to do more education and understanding and passion. Once you pressure test them a couple times, they become a champion. So it's a, it's a really slow process. You don't go from zero awareness or contact to champion, and it doesn't happen in the first meeting. And so you have to manage these relationships over a period of time and experiences. Anything to add, Chris? I'd just say relationship management is a job. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, it's something you almost have to assume somebody comes in every day and is thinking of who you want to cultivate what's been done for them lately, have they been um, invited or rewarded or acknowledged as well as asked to do something because um, busy but also not an expert in living it day in, in and out. So what you can do is pretend you're staffing them on it, you know, just behave like staff to them on it. And I think people really start responding to you when they see you working for them on it. Great point. Okay, so another question. Great. Come on up. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dr. Sharon Brown. I work with the North Carolina uh, Child Care Health and Safety Resource Center. I'm also uh, working in the Eastern Region as a CCHC coach. And I know that there are a number of people here that represent different groups within early uh, child care. With our focus with health and safety, we really are trying to improve the numbers of uh, child care health consultants. We want one in every county by at least in five years. So and to do that, we've got to start influencing some people. And my background, uh, previous background, has been um, heavy into what I re finally referred to as unpaid lobbying <laughs> for my state nursing organizations in North and South Carolina, California, and then some neighborhood advocacy work. And um, I've been described as a steel magnolia um, and also um, my favorite uh, statement from someone at the Tucson um, Council meeting. She goes, Sharon, you don't take any prisoners, do you? <laughs> from that, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling very schizophrenic 
coming back into North Carolina because I do have a southern background <laughs> and I do feel like I can't get into somebody's face so they can smell my breath. <laughs> but I also want to instill in at least those that I uh, coach and mentor um, that you need to speak up for yourself. You need to advocate for what it is you do, what you do well, and let those that make these decisions related to the early care uh, in the state and very much the direction of where it's going, let them know how much you can impact that. Do you have some pearls of wisdom of how to deal with individual specialties within the greater umbrella and particularly some advice of how to work with North Carolina? Well, can I please? You're the only one leaning in, Chris. It's on you. <laughs> I've been, I feel your pain. I have been in your shoes. I didn't get very much done when I was in my silo worried about my program, my staff, my funding. I got a lot further, a lot faster when I went into rooms with people like me and we kind of put aside as much as we could our individual interest and looked for some of these bigger interests that have to do with the future and helping kids with their educational needs, et cetera. And I know that sounds simple and, e and, and maybe overly simple, but when you got as deep as you did just now in describing what you do, no offense, but that messaging isn't gonna carry you very far. And I think what is hard about being so expert in something is that you want everyone to understand it as much as you do. And you've gotta let go of that rope a little bit and hold on to one that everybody's on because it's, it's lonely on your only rope. Um, and, I, and, I, and I feel it, I get it totally, but it isn't gonna help you with major re election cycles where people who control all the public funds are getting jobs and deciding what happens to you. So I just think you're in a, you know, it, it, the pressure's on you honestly to compel them to do something, not the other way around. So let me offer a bit of clarification on getting in people's face. You can, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You can, you can get in people's face in a North Carolina way, right? Yeah. Which, Describe like, that, please. Well, look, I, I worked in North Carolina politics for a, for a long time in a, in a former career. And you know what? What it struck me down here is that, you know, and I come from California and I lived in New York and I come down here, and a lot of business happened when people sat down with somebody and asked them about their family and their church and about this and about that. And they had a conversation for 45 minutes where I was just about ready to die. Okay. <laughs> when are we going to get around to it? And then the conversation ended and I realized, well, we did get around to it. They made a connection, right? And they were human. So I think that part of getting things done is to go and to make that connection and then make it a little bit wider and wider. I'll, I'll tell you a little story. When I came to, to Washington, the, one of the first people I worked for was a guy named Sidney Yates, a congressman, Sidney Yates. Sidney, when I met him, was something like 86 or 88. And every single year, he saved the National Endowment of the Arts from massive budget cuts at a time when the money was going to performance artists who were doing really crazy things with potatoes in their anatomy, okay? <laughs> And nobody could figure out how he did it. And finally, when Sidney finally, when he died at, in office at age, I don't know, like in his 90s, a very, very conservative Republican got up from a quote unquote flyover state and said, let me tell you how Sidney did this. I was a first termer and I was on this committee and he needed my vote and he came in and said, what do you know about opera? And I said, absolutely nothing and I hate it. And he said, well, listen to this. And he gave me a little cassette he made me. And he came back once a week and asked me if I listened to this cassette. Finally, I had to listen to this cassette. So I listened to it and thought it was people screaming. <laughs> so the next time he came in, I said, don't give me any more of these because it's people screaming. And he said, well, let me explain it to you. And so he sat and explained the opera to him. And he says, to this day, I am one of the biggest and probably the only opera fans in my state. And I voted for the NEA each time based on that conversation and my introduction to the larger arts and culture that is out there. That's how you get in people's faces. You, you do it in a way that's culturally appropriate for where you are. 
and, and to underscore that, I mean, what I hear underscoring a lot of what you're saying is data is important, stories are important, relationships are where things happen. Mm -hmm. And putting that time and energy into developing those relationships with lots of different people. We, I think as a field, we have stayed for a long time. I think it's changing pretty insular, and we have to be uncomfortable um, talking to people we might not have talked to before. Thank you. Thanks. So we are out of time. We've hit 3 o'clock. As I said, it's always good leaving people with questions because it means, you know, the interest was there. <laughs> I can't thank you enough, Brenda, Rich, and Chris, for being here and sharing your wisdom. Thank you all.